Welcome to another How to Succeed podcast. This is How to Succeed at Selling SaaS with Josh Shirley. Thanks for the alliteration there, Josh. Uh, we <laughs> are brought to you by Sandler, the worldwide leader in sales management and customer service training. For more information, go to sandler.com. Ton of resources under the Insights tab. You can reach out to a local office or our enterprise team if you are an enterprise organization. Uh, this week, we're talking about how to succeed at selling SaaS with Josh Shirley, a longtime Sandler trainer, and I'm really excited to jump into it. So let's go. All right, Josh, tell us a little bit about selling SaaS. How is that yes. different from selling like a piece of machinery or uh, any other like kind of tangible object or or any other regular service? I think. Yeah, it's sassy. It's it's different. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, chances are, if you work for a SaaS company and you are selling SaaS, you are trying to sell something that makes somebody's life easier. So there's just some different challenges here. First of all, your product might not really be known. So there's not necessarily a known quantity. There aren't competitors in your marketplace. So the customer doesn't have uh, a previous understanding of, of how you help and what you do. It's a big piece of the challenge. Other side, there are some underlying forces at work when it comes to software that are just in the space. It's somewhat of a manufactured industry, meaning a, a lot of the a lot of the what you're a lot of the situations you're going to find yourself in are uh, funded. Meaning, my company got its start not from selling it growing it, building it, selling it more. It got its start because we got a lot of money from somewhere. And mm -hmm. sometimes that takes some of the uh, some of the things that you'll find in other sales organizations out of the equation. And they just aren't there culturally. So there's just a few underpinnings, Mike, that are working, that can work for you in SaaS and against you. We'll talk about that. Yeah, I think there's a, a lot of meat on the bone here this week because you mentioned a couple of things for me. One, selling an intangible is just different than, than a, you know, a piece of machinery or medical yeah. equipment or, or something. Uh, but also in that SaaS world, it does tend to be startups. And we see interesting things as sales trainers. Like they try to sell it with marketing first. So they'll yes. be like, you know what? We're just going to do a free demo on the website. People fall in love with the demo. We'll hit mm -hmm. that credit card when they're done. And we yeah. don't need salespeople at all. And then they call us about three years in and they're like, we need some sales. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. It's, <laughs> it's a, it's an emergency that it, that's exactly how it starts. Mike. Like, 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 yeah, I talked to a lot the of other way too, which is like, we're, we don't have that funding yet. We need to be scrappy. We need salespeople to go out there and really sell and build That's the true. demand. And they're doing demand creation, almost the marketing job because they can't afford to do a big, you know, uh, digital campaign or something to grow those on, on their own. Yeah. And so they're trying to bootstrap and get enough up to get funded That's and they right. got to sell all those manually, whether it's the founder or, or anything else. So I think there is an interesting challenge where you don't really get that natural growth, that proven market. People know what they, what you do, what they're buying. And, and it's a really, you know, easy discussion. It's not budgeted, it's not funded. And a lot of times they're not aware of the problem that you solve. Even this is a new solution. I'm thinking about AI stuff and, right. and things like, I didn't even know I could automate that. So that that wasn't even on our radar as something to buy this year. Exactly. I've always done it this way. I've always downloaded this data into a spreadsheet, done my own pivot ta table called Judy. Judy does her role on this, right? We work together. And then two weeks later, we have our analysis that's ready. What, like, what do you, what is this sorcery that you're trying to sell me that there, I can do it instantly. That's not real. Right. So there's some incredulity it just in just just baked into the into the customers minds, especially if you're the first entrant into your market. So I think that takes us right into attitude. We already talked about some of the common myths and misconceptions, but I, I think there are more when you specifically think about selling SaaS that they um, tend to lean heavy on the demo, on the product. Yeah. They want it to kind of sell its, itself versus going for those needs and, and understanding what problem it's solving and how to build value 
with the service other than just saying we're saving you time which means uh -huh. that saves you money and you can afford to to buy this and they they try to make it maybe more intellectual or or have people fall in love with the product rather than solve a problem is that fair yeah yeah i, I think the attitude a lot of times comes down to uh we're first and the person i'm speaking to doesn't necessarily understand that this even exists and so i have to lean more on education which forces me out of one of our favorite equations mike the 70 30 rule right mm -hmm. so we've got a we feel compelled to talk more about our solution to get somebody to understand it so that the conversation can even begin and so what can affect our attitude there is just this idea that we have to sort of push on everybody uh, our brand message so that we can be understood and, and we can we can share our positioning. So that's a that's something that really gets in the way a lot of times with with if you're selling SaaS is that the idea or the attitude that you don't understand my product. Therefore, I have to lean so heavily on talking about it. And I see CEOs do this all the time where you're not saying it this way. They don't yeah. understand. You have to talk more about the product. Why didn't they see a demo? And, and it's all the attitude that we have to educate using our platform. Now, what would be the ideal attitude then? Like I get that inherently. I, I figure like most of the people on this are probably uh, familiar with Sandler and stuff that we have that 70 through 30 rule. The, the buyer should be talking the majority of the time, not That's us. Right. We want to be asking great questions, not telling. And if you're and people don't argue with their own data. That's one of right. our, our favorite new Sandler rules, which is like we need to get them to tell us why our solution works in their world, not us saying, oh, look, we've done all this data and analysis and we know we're going to save you, you know, uh, these hours per week or, or whatever and, and start trying to justify it. We need them to give us that that data. But I feel like there's also some other attitudes that, that you need to take if you're selling SaaS. Uh, what comes to mind for you? Yeah, just uh, the idea that yeah, well, I guess I guess I can frame this up in a story, Mike. Like I, I used mm -hmm. to work at a, a local tech startup. And so I noticed that our sales actually went down after the product got to a point where we could show it and demo it. Mm. So you'll never guess what the majority of those calls became, which is, oh, I can show you how this works. So the attitude that I, what I need to qualify is the person. I need to qualify the prospect, not the technology or not the technological fit. Mm. So tell me more about that, because I think that's interesting. When we think about qualification at Sandler, that's pain, budget and decision. Right. In, in SaaS, it ends up being things like does it integrate with their tech stack? Yeah. Are they uh, an Apple or a PC, you know, house <laughs> or or whatever? And do they have iPhones or Androids? Not um, do they have a problem we, we could solve? Right. Exactly. Well, it transitioned really quickly. So here, here's the trap and, and how how the listener, the salesperson might get into it. So the 70-30 rule can sometimes, you know, go unbroken throughout an entire call, but here's, here's the sort of underpinnings of, of what happens, right? So I start to ask some questions. I'm, I'm qualifying you and I get some surface level pain, which might be something for a lot of SaaS solutions, they're out there because they make somebody's life at work easier. And so uh, somebody might be telling you, for example, well, I, I spend a lot of time like to do this analysis, to get these results, to understand my data, to solve this problem. I have to do it myself. And so we hear that pain indicator and we don't go far enough down the pain funnel to find out how long they've been doing it. And we just bail on the pain train super early mm -hmm. and we jump out and uh, we start to qualify not the person but we start to qualify the platform meaning okay good can you tell me how your current manual process works well 
what I do is I send, you know, an email out to my 15 different offices and for them to do this audit or for them to input this information, they fill out a Google form and then I get all those responses back. And then I go through in my spreadsheet and then I do my magic and then later there's, there's a result, right? So, so now yeah. I've told you my, and so now I've started thinking about how I can solve that problem, but I'm in a completely intellectual place. I am like, yeah. I am, I am just talking about the ones and zeros about how the technology can solve the problem itself, not how I can solve the problem that the person has. And so you get stuck because now I'm using my platform to do the qualification for me because I'm afraid that later on there's going to be something that trips this deal up technically that I'm worried right. about. And so those are okay. I, I think I like, uh, you know, some of the changes that we've made to the Sandler selling system metaphor these days of making it yeah. more circular and stuff. I think it's okay to do a mini qualification step and just say, Hey, sure. real quick, let's check the boxes. Does, do you have this? Do you have this? Do you have this? If that's great, then we can talk about a solution. If you don't even have those, then we're wasting both of our times, right? That's so right. it's okay to do a quick check on those intellectual things. But I love what you're saying there because I think you're right. So many people jump out to the intellectual justification. They don't worry about that person's feelings, that they're frustrated, they're worried, exactly. they're concerned about something. They're upset that they're not, their bosses aren't seeing their value because they feel like they're exactly. only doing busy work on spreadsheets and not adding, you know, value or, or big jumps in productivity because uh, you can only get so fast at doing that, right? And so they're worried yep. about keeping their job and not about the the actual outcome here. And I think that brings something else to mind that we should probably talk about. And I don't know where it fits in attitude, behavior, or technique. But um, when you're selling this person, a lot of times you're talking about automating their job, yes. which is a, a more sensitive discussion than a technical one about can we possibly do this or not? Right. But what happens to that person if we do? Yeah, well, I, I think this fits in the technique drawer, Mike. So meaning... If if you imagine at some point, either the first person you talk to or when Karen shows up to the meeting to evaluate the platform because she's part of this decision making process. OK, now I've got to talk about how my solution works, that it exists. I got to start from ground zero with Karen. So the temptation is to talk about how things work technically and to start talking about what it actually does. Because in software, you look, j just because of some of the, the setup that we talked about earlier, a lot of the leads that people are, 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 are dealing with, I would classify as sales development. Meaning I'm actually developing a, a lead that has been born by some other means besides direct prospecting. So it's came to my website. And because it was generated that way, it is now I'm talking to a practitioner. And when I start talking to a practitioner about what my platform does, instead of what you just mentioned, Mike, which is I got a bad relationship with my CEO. I got a bad right. relationship with my CFO who's on my butt all the time because my analysis is always late or I never get the data on time or my numbers are off. That's the real problem. And it's no different than any other industry. But when I go into my 30 second commercial to help Karen understand what it is my platform does, what I might not realize technique wise is that that might be her job. That might mm -hmm. be the practitioner's job. Like, okay, what we do is we take data out of these different carrier platforms so that you can understand your small parcel spend for the year. And we have a solution that aggregates all that data and puts it into a nice clean dashboard. Well, I just described somebody's <laughs> job. And so that person might hear, oh, you're here for my job. That's not okay, right? So instead of talking about the pain that's underneath some of the issues that are sort of on top of it are in that reasons belt of the pain funnel. If we don't yeah. go below that and really understand what the person's actually dealing with, we're just left with things that we do. And a lot of times in software, that's the same thing your prospects do. 
Uh, I love that. And I think this, this pain conversation is extremely valuable, but I think there's a couple of other things here in the qualification that also are different in SaaS. Uh, yeah. One is the budget and they're usually sold in this recurring revenue that we all like, right? The subscription right. model. And it's been extremely powerful for the business world, but I also feel and I don't know if you're hearing this in the SaaS world, but people are just getting sassed out. They're like, like yeah. all of us with our cable subscriptions and stuff. We're like, look, if I'm signing up for Disney Plus, I'm canceling Paramount because yeah. I cannot handle any more of these. Like I'm not watching all of them. And I feel like businesses <laughs> are kind of getting the same way where it's like our sales tech stack is getting pretty high. We got the CRM. We've got these other tools. We've got, you know, call recording softwares and other things like stacked on top as well as our you know microsoft 365 is a subscription now and everything is piling on that they're just like i just don't want another monthly fee and then the budget here too and i'm feel like i'm stealing all the low-lying fruit so i'll let you jump in here in a second but <laughs> keep going my right. other problem with SaaS is that a lot of times it's not even the money investment they're like okay yeah. we can afford 50 dollars a salesperson for the software but it's the change. We got to get yeah. salespeople to actually use it. And I feel right. like most of the SaaS problems come in there. They're like, okay, no, it does what it says it does. But the problem is our team is not using it. So now we're just paying this monthly fee for something that is not, you know, getting used and, and enabled in the organization. And that's yeah. a bigger investment of getting behavioral change is harder than getting a check in Absolutely. most organizations. Absolutely. And I'll, I'll steal a line that I've heard on this show. Uh, mm -hmm. The problem is always to the left. So what that means to me is if I'm in a situation where maybe I sell something and it doesn't get the adoption that I that I want to see. So maybe I have an account in software that's not growing. Well, you know, that comes back to the budget step. But if I don't do a good pain funnel first, if I don't check the boxes on what we just talked about, I got to make sure, okay, well, the problem is I won't get my bonus if I can't get this analysis done on time or if I can't reduce costs in my department by 10% somehow, mm. then that affects me personally. Once I'm there, then I think the budget step has to happen. And to your point, Mike, what somebody's likely to hear in this industry is, well, you just showed up with this sorcery that we didn't know existed. So, of course, there's not a budget for, you know, uh, safety intelligence or whatever the, your, the software is that you're selling. So I think we have to stay, stay where we've been trained to stay, which is in a not OK place. Mm -hmm. And it could be, look. Mike, I, I'm getting the sense through the discussion that I might be able to help you. But there's just some things here with budget that uh, are in the way, and I'm concerned. So I see a roadblock to being able to help you achieve this milestone, which gets you your bonus at the end of the year. What do you think you're going to do? So I think the, the, the advice here is let's not make it our problem. It's their problem yeah. to go get the money. And when it comes to, to, to budget, I think we also, in software in particular, have to widen that category out more than other industries into what you just talked about, which is the energy that it's going to require for us to do things differently as a business and say, look, you know, um, if I'm not hearing the pain in the funnel that I need to hear, the, the challenge could sound like, Mike, it, can I be honest here? It, it just doesn't sound like this is that big of a deal. Um, right. And, and what I'm worried about is, you know, if we get moving on this thing, we both get excited. I come to you with a solution. It could solve your problem. And I'm going to ask you to write me a check. But you also are going to need a point person on the account who understands it and filters communication to other users, a champion who's responsible for training within your organization after we pack up and leave. Hmm. And right. I'm just concerned that you're not going to do any of that stuff. Is that right? Right. Like, so we have some kind of sense of helping them understand that the cost is not just in that check. It's not just in the money. It's also for software, 
are you going to have the capacity, the bandwidth, the buy-in, the dedication and conviction to learn how to do things differently, learn how to use our platform? Because I've seen it not work. And when it not when it doesn't work, it's usually because we're talking about a problem that really isn't that big to solve. So can we stay focused on that? Yeah, what I'm hearing is it's a great rule. Uh, another saying in the rule, if you're going to fight, fight up front. Yeah. That Like, I don't want to come back here in a year at renewal time and you say it was a great idea, but nobody's using it. Yeah. Like, that's a, a loss for both of us. So how do right. we prevent that up front and make sure that this pain is big enough, that there's an incentive big enough for your team to start using this this platform, too? It that's can't right. just be a good idea. It's got to be something that you absolutely have to use um, in order to get the results that that you want here. Yeah. And now, go ahead. At last, just topic that is related to that in software, like you've seen it, Mike. Like we sell it first, we build it second, and we service it third. Mm. And so a lot of times if you're in software and you're listening to this, you might be one of those people in that last category. Like you're a CSM, a client solutions manager, somebody who's actually servicing and responsible for the renewal that you just discussed. So I think it's important, especially in software companies, to understand that our job as account managers is to help paint a very clear picture of the future and which is solved pain. So I have to be just as good, if not better than the account executive going to win the business and asking those questions and finding pain and taking that nugget of pain and putting it at the end of my buy cycle or at the end of when the contract runs out and say, look, Mike, we're trying to cut your cost by 10%. These are the things we need to do in order to help you achieve the goal and now all the meetings we're going to have in between now and then are in service to that objective. And just trying to help them renew and retain with strategy like that, as opposed to the putting out of fires that happens in that lane. And I thought that was worth mentioning based on the budget discussion that we had. Yeah. And then that takes us to decision, which is kind of our, our last, uh, I consider this behavioral bucket, but we're also covering the techniques as we go along here. Yeah. But um, we got to do these things in order because in decision with SaaS, you get a lot of other decision makers that you might not get in other typical sales, like yeah. legal compliance and data security and IT integrations. And then you have the end users and everybody taking a look at it, it too. It feels like it's almost the entire organization has to sign off on one of these these days, right? Um, depending on what you sell, I suppose. But uh, would not be unusual. So what are your thoughts here on the decision step? And well, whether real or perceived, there's economic challenges out there that are at a minimum perceived by leadership in these in these companies that you're selling to. And so what that means is the decision step has gotten longer as these executives that are previously disconnected from a purchase like this, get closer to making these decisions and have to get mm -hmm. more involved. So I've got more people. So table stakes, there's just a higher ante that we've got to, to play here when it comes to, to, to these decisions. I would say that in software sales, you typically are dealing with a wider, net, not necessarily deeper, but wider uh, decision uh, cast the characters than in these other places. So uh, meaning, for example, data security is one that I see all the time. You're going to store and warehouse our data. Like a, a huge percentage of software companies are solving some kind of data problem, whether it's to visualize something to coax it into some expression for analysis or it's to move the data from one place to another so that I eliminate these manual processes or both, you are now talking about taking somebody's proprietary information and putting it into another place. And so you can definitely count on, in those instances, somebody from data security. Mm -hmm. So to kind of bounce this off the technique piece, right? Let's try and get those, those things sorted out. Let's be a a trusted advisor whenever we go into these discussions to say, Mike, 
this is good. It sounds like the decision process is, is you and then Karen shows up because she's the operating officer to make sure this isn't going on on the other side of the planet somewhere. I heard a couple of things you didn't say. One of those was uh, there's somebody uh, who cares about the integrity and insecurity of the data. Should we be talking to that person as well as an example of how to technique wise approach that? Right. So that security issue is definitely there. Operations is always in the room just because, you know, they're trying to operationalize and solve problems in the company. Finance is, is usually there. I usually like to think of it as a, a three tip sphere on who who's interested in it politically, financially and technically. Try to try to take your decision questions with that destination in mind when you're asking them. I love that. Now, I want to give you one last shot at it here, and I want to get to know you a little bit better to ask you some personal questions. But sure. we're talking with Josh Shirley, a sailor trainer from Kansas City and a co-host of the Sales Tales podcast. We forgot to shout out the podcast earlier. I was a guest on there recently, yeah. too. So since you're currently listening to podcasts, you're probably in a sales podcast. You're probably a qualified listener to go check out uh, Josh's uh, podcast. So, um Last shot at it. Anything else you think common uh, attitudes, behaviors, techniques, or anything that's important that we missed, we should have asked along the way? All, all good. I, I think in, in software, I just think know where you come from, which is you're coming from an industry that does not have a traditional selling focus. And I don't mean traditional selling in the way that we in Sandler refer to traditional selling. I, I mean that the product hasn't had to prove itself in the market before the company you're working for took shape. And that means that there are some beliefs and potentially some head trash in the company about how you're supposed to win, right? So as salespeople, what we want to do is control our destiny. And at the end of the day, every tech CEO who wants to get his or her funding round set has to show to somebody else that as a company, we can like solve the math problem from input to output, meaning we can control our destiny by investing this much and we can expect to gain that much. That process is somewhat broken down inside of SaaS where uh, we haven't necessarily had to earn money this way before. And so salespeople are really sort of doing sales development. They're, they're getting leads from marketing and processing those types of things. And we can only hire and scale the team if there's more marketing and more expense and more leads to process. That's just a little bit backwards. And so know where you come from means understand that, that some of the head trash that forms can be from just some of the foundational pieces of how, how the company came, came about. I'll love that. And I'll double down with the shameless plug. That's really where Sandler helps the, these companies because right. um, we've done this before. We can help you design that sales process and business development process to, to actually sell in hand-to-hand -hand combat. And two, even if you are, a lot of our programs have this, what we call semi-private training when you're in with other companies. And when your SaaS salespeople hear how other people in other industries like roofing or HVAC or something a completely yeah. unrelated cell, they go, oh, wow, I didn't even know you could do that. Or right. I've never even heard of that part of the, the process. And it's amazing that those companies are doing million dollar sales and they, they can't demo the roof. Like they, we can't show you what it looks like exactly. on there and, and stuff. So, uh, and what the experience is. So they, they have different, um, you know, attitudes, behaviors, and techniques. And just sometimes just being aware of those is one of the most powerful things that I've seen SaaS companies and, and service companies and Sandler realize throughout the training. Yeah. All right, Josh, uh, time to get to know you. First question is, how do you define success at this point in your career? Uh, well, I, I, well, first thing I do is I kind of look at whether it's an identity or, or a role situation. And so, mm -hmm. In role in sales, uh, I you know define success by um, you know the the difference between what it costs and what the customer is paying, and so there's a metric there for you, um, and also in just being fulfilled for me is is a is a huge component of it. So outside of the sales success metrics, like 
that most important thing for me is, uh, am I, did I make a connection with somebody every day where I've been able to help somebody flip a light switch on? Yeah. That's amazing. Now, um, great question here that I love to ask every guest is, was there a, a biggest failure you're most proud of or a particularly hard lesson learned you had to get over in order to be successful in your career? Yeah. As a sales leader, I'd say my, one of my biggest failures is, um, is I was too protective of my people. Uh, I'm, I'm a protective person by nature. Just my, my scripting from early on, just kind of, that's, that's just what I came out of, um, particularly of, of others that I'm, that I'm managing or working coaching or, or whatever. Uh, and so I, I was protective of them to the point where I wouldn't let them fail. So mm-hmm. it had a good side in that, you know, okay, if, if, I, I need to go have a tough to, conversation to fight for you in, with the with upper management. I need to talk to the CEO in, or whoever and make sure that I advocate for you. And that, that created a lot of really strong bonds with my people. But where I let them down was that I tried to rescue them from the pain of, of learning a good lesson. And I didn't trust that, okay, like not knowing how to price something I would just come in and price it and kind of solve the problem and I'd get my needs met and I never, you know, let them go about doing it on their own so that they could experience that and grow. And I, as a result, I think I prevented them from growing and that's, that's a big lesson learned. Yeah. Yeah. It's a big lesson for managers and uh, parents, right? That reminded me, I don't have any kids, but it just reminds me of like, sometimes you got to allow people to, to experience some fails in order right. to grow and get stronger and build their own resilience. And so it's I think that's an amazing do. lesson. It's a hard uh, do. do you have a favorite saying the rule? Yes. Leave, leave your mom in the car. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's funny. We usually say you leave your child in the car, but we actually changed that rule too, because that's not a, a great metaphor, but tell us what it, what it means in your world. So, yeah, I've uh, I've heard Sandler say, I don't know if it's a chronicled rule, but yeah, in, in, in teaching TA, he talks about leave your mom in the car, leave your kid. In, and he talks about, well, you're going to need a bigger car is like a third rule. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I, I, I just really it resonates with me because uh, what I, you know, I just talked about that, that fail that, you know, and I think a lot of that just comes from all the way back. Like when you walk into a sales meeting, or you walk into uh, to service your customer, you're not just walking in there, but uh, your mom's coming with you. Your dad's coming with you. Uh, you as a child is walking in there. And so keep the conversation between your nurturing parent and your adult, meaning like nurturing, being a nurturing parent or, or going to that ego state. Uh, of, uh, of, of being more nurturing, I think has really serviced me well. And, uh, when I've not done that, it's, it's been, it's been a hard lesson. Uh, I love it. The new Sandler rule number one in the latest book, how to sell to the modern buyer is sales is a conversation between adults to uncover the the truth. That's if right. you want to know what that means, either get the book, how to sell to the modern buyer, or just go over to the YouTube channel. If you're not already and uh, search for Sandler rule number one, um, it's a great lesson because you're right. All that head trash of uh, from your mom saying, you know, and dad, don't talk about money. Uh, don't talk to strangers. And then you get into sales and they're like, hey, go talk to strangers about yeah. money. Yeah. And yeah. You about have money. To, like, reset yeah. All of- yeah. Get involved with somebody else's decision, which is another thing that you're supposed yeah. to give people space and let them decide. Like there's a lot, a lot you're fighting against. Leave your mom in the car. Tell us about your podcast. Podcast is called Sales Tales. Uh, it's for anybody who wants to get better at sales while they while they drive, you know, or mm-hmm. while they're working out. Just um, it's 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 a great listen for people who like storytelling and podcasts. So uh, our best experiences come from our successes and our failures, and so we get our guests to tell it what's called a sales tale of greatness, and we unpack that. And then we reverse that into a sales fail and we learn about that. And every time we have a guest, there's a target topic. And we also have some shows where 
we just break down selling strategies. So every episode is about the length of your favorite, you know, uh, TV show. And so it's um, in, in a commute to and back from work, you should get an episode in. It's a lot of fun. We have a segment on most episodes called Food from the Road. So for the traveling salesperson, you'll get a different strategy, like you'll get a different uh, city, different restaurant and a different meal to try in each of the episodes where we make some suggestions. And so you might find yourself going to a convention in Orlando and listen to sales tales and we'll tell you where to go and what to get. I love it. Good stuff. Go check that one out. And don't forget to subscribe to this podcast, the How to Succeed podcast, wherever you are listening or watching to it right now. Share that episode with uh, somebody that you think needs to hear it. Sandler.com. You can click on the Insights tab, get all of our free resources, find out about the next uh, free educational webinar, or get your tickets to the Sandler Summit. It is coming up just around the corner. So March 19th and 20th, go to Sandler.com slash summit for more information. And then again, if you're trying to find a, a trainer, you don't have one yet, you can go to the Locations tab, find one near you. Or if you're an enterprise location and you have like 100 people in multiple locations, can reach out to our enterprise team we have people that help there too until next time whatever you are be a good one that's what i always say see you everybody bye